Hello, government students. Hey, today we're going to be talking about public opinion. Uh, we've been talking in the past couple of weeks about uh, political parties and elections, and public opinion is going to impact elections and political party membership, and political parties will also impact public opinion. Um, I'm going to be moving pretty fast in this presentation, so be sure to uh, hit the pause button if you need to to get all the notes that you need. And with that, let's get started. So first, let's define public opinion. Public opinion are those attitudes held by a significant number of people on matters of government and politics. So for example, if I want to know whether or not uh, most Americans are going to vote Democratic in the next election, uh, that would be an example of public opinion. It deals with government and politics. If I want to know whether or not most Americans are in favor of a woman's right to choose an abortion, that would also be a matter of public opinion. Uh, however, if I want to know whether or not most Americans like or dislike broccoli, the vegetable, uh, that would not be public opinion. That has nothing to do with government and politics. So, public opinion is shaped by multiple factors. Uh, the news and social media will affect public opinion. There's all kinds of stuff that you would see in Facebook uh, feeds that might impact the way you think about uh, issues. And of course, the news can also um, frame issues in such a way that, that it will sway your opinion on certain types of issues. Uh, events can affect public opinion. So uh, recently, as I record this, Russia has attacked Ukraine. As a result of that attack on Ukraine, Public opinion has changed in America about the need for strong alliances, a strong NATO. Uh, some people believe that we should now increase military spending in America. Um, and this is a direct result of the event, the Russian attack on Ukraine. Group identity. By that, I'm talking about things like, uh, do, you do you identify yourself as an African-American or do you identify yourself as a... Um, uh, let's say as a Southerner. Um, if you identify yourself as a Southerner, chances are you're going to tend to identify yourself as a Republican because Republicans have a lot more uh, support in the South than Democrats in general. Uh, so that kind of group identity can impact uh, your uh, public opinion. Do you identify yourself as a Republican or a Democrat, a conservative or a liberal? All that will impact how you view issues and your public opinion. Socialization. Who do you hang out with? Uh, your family, your friends, all of those people, your, the people that you hang with, that you interact with, they can impact your uh, public opinion, your, your views on issues as well. And then finally, politicians and public figures will impact public opinion. Uh, if a politician is well-liked, uh, that will certainly impact people's opinions about the issues that that politician supports. Public figures uh, will impact public opinion as well. That's why politicians like to get endorsements from celebrities. Uh, if you like particular celebrities and that celebrity, excuse me, celebrity endorses a particular candidate, you may be more likely to support that candidate as well. Let's talk about measuring public opinion. And in fact, we're going to spend most of the rest of this uh, presentation on ways to measure public opinion. Uh, public opinion can be measured in various ways. It can be measured through elections. In the election of 2020, uh, Democrats maintained their majority in the House of Representatives. They won a new majority in the Senate, and the Democrats also won the presidency. So that election of 2020 would certainly indicate that in that year, the Democratic Party and its, its uh, candidates and its positions were more popular than those of the Republican Party. So we could measure public opinion through those election results. Media choices. In America and many countries, there are uh, certain media outlets that tend to be quite liberal. Certain media outlets tend to be quite conservative. There are also media outlets that try not to, to voice any kind of bias at all. If you have a situation where um, a very conservative media outlet, such as in America, Fox News, which, which is conservative, gets a whole lot more viewership than, say, the more liberal MSNBC, that would indicate then that public opinion in America tends to be more conservative than liberal because conservative media gets more viewership. Personal contacts. 
again, it's kind of like socialization, uh, but kind of almost the mirror image of socialization. Uh, if your personal contacts uh, tend to believe one way, let's say everyone that you hung out with uh, in 2020 wanted Donald Trump to be president, then you might measure public opinion as supportive of Donald Trump, more so than Joe Biden. Of course, the obvious problem with using personal contacts to uh, measure public opinion is that you're, you hang out with people who probably tend to think like you in the first place, and your immediate social group may not really be representative of America as a whole, as the whole public. But again, you could certainly use your personal contacts as a way to measure public opinion. And then finally, opinion polls. Opinion polls are the way we usually measure public opinion to try to get at least a more accurate view of what public opinion is. So let's take a look at opinion polls. And really, we'll finish our, our presentation with opinion polls. There's a lot to discuss here. First of all, there's two types of opinion polls. A straw poll is where a specific group of people are polled. Uh, so, for example, I might want to know uh, in 2020 uh, who's going to be president, who's going to be elected president. And I could look at my classroom full of 17 and 18 year old high school students who are mostly white uh, and mostly um, middle class and ask them who they prefer to be elected in the presidential election, Donald Trump or Joe Biden. Uh, that would be a straw poll. It's a specific group of people gathered together and they're going to voice their opinion. I don't think that's a particularly reliable poll to get the uh, public opinion of America as a whole because I don't believe that 17 and 18 year old mostly white people who attend a private school and are middle class are really going to be representative of America as a whole. So straw polls really are not particularly reliable and as a result, usually we want to use scientific polls to get a more accurate picture. Scientific polls really were developed in the 1930s, and there's five steps to a good, reliable scientific poll. First, you must define the universe that's to be surveyed. In other words, what this means is whose opinion are we really wanting to get? Okay, is it the opinion of all Americans or opinion of all, you know, 18-year-olds, whatever? We need to define the universe. Once we've defined the universe, we need to construct a representative sample. Uh, if I wanted to know what 18-year-olds think about a particular issue, I cannot ask every 18-year-old. There's too many 18-year-olds in America, in America for me to ask. So I've got to find a smaller representative sample that would, that would accurately reflect all 18-year-olds in America. That's not easy to do. Then I have to prepare valid questions. I have to select how those questions are going to be delivered, and I have to report the findings. And when I report the findings, I need to make sure it's clear, all of my methodology on the poll is clear when I report those findings, so if there's any flaws, uh, they can be readily uh, identified. Okay, there are problems with polls, and let's look at problems with each individual step. First of all, defining the universe. Let's say I want to know who Americans are going to choose to be the next president. Well, what's my universe? Is it going to be all adult Americans? Well, I know that not all adult Americans vote, so that might not be the best universe. Maybe I should only look at my universe as being registered voters. Obviously, you have to be registered in order to vote, so this might be a better universe of, of Americans to poll. However, I also know that not all registered voters actually vote. So maybe a better universe would be people who have voted in past elections. This probably would be the best universe to use of these three choices. However, it's not a per perfect uh, universe either, because even though you may have voted in past elections and will likely vote in the next election, there's no guarantee that you'll vote in the next election. And this particular universe leaves out those people who were not old enough to vote in the last election and now are. So again, this is not a perfect universe, but it probably is the best of these three because we do know that people who voted in past elections are likely to vote in coming elections. Getting the representative sample is not easy to pinpoint. If I'm going to want to have a universe of 
registered voters who voted in past elections, it's going to be hard to get that universe defined and then even harder to get a representative sample of those individuals. And for example, as this cartoon would indicate, if I were to poll someone and ask you know, on the phone if they had um, uh, voted in the last election, <laughs> People may not answer the phone in the first place, or they may not. They may they may hang up the phone because they don't want to take a poll, or they might even tell a lie and not give me a truthful answer. Developing valid questions can be very difficult, um, as this cartoon suggests. Um, you don't want to have questions that are leading you to answer the question in one specific way. Um, the wording will will impact your results. Let's look at a couple of, of actual examples from actual polls. This is from early 2000s when we went to war or were about to go to war against Saddam Hussein in Iraq. The question in a poll asked, would you favor or oppose taking military action in Iraq to end Saddam Hussein's rule? When asked in that way, 68% of respondents answered yes. However, if we ask that question differently, would you favor or oppose taking military action in Iraq to end Saddam Hussein's rule, even if it meant that U.S. forces might suffer thousands of casualties? In this case, only 43% of respondents answered yes. In fact, more people answered no than yes when we added that phrase that we might suffer thousands of casualties. So questions, the wording has a big impact. Here's another example. Do you favor making it legal for doctors to give terminally ill patients the means to end their lives? When asked this way, 51% said yes. However, if I ask it in this way, do you favor making it legal for doctors to assist terminally ill patients to commit suicide? By adding that word suicide, only 44% answered yes. It's the same issue. The means to end your life is committing suicide, but that word suicide is a highly charged uh, word which elicits a negative response. How uh, questions are delivered are going to uh, present a challenge and potential problem with polls. So are we going to use, for example, the telephone? If I start calling up people, a lot of people with caller ID won't answer the phone if they don't know who the person is that is calling. So that's going to impact big time uh, the representative sample. Direct mail, very few people will respond to direct mail. The internet, eh, not everyone is going to be checking the internet or the source of the, you know, whatever internet website I'm using to deliver this poll. Um, that will certainly have an impact. In person, door to door, a lot of people don't want to answer the door if they don't know who that is that's ringing the doorbell. Again, it's going to have an impact. You could do it in person at a centralized location, like at the mall, have a booth at the mall. Um, but again, it's just really hard to get your questions delivered in such a way that, that you still are getting your representative sample of the universe polled. Finally, you've got to report the findings. Uh, and the results of multiple polls may contradict one another, and you have to be able to explain why. A, a lot of times this will have to do with the way the question is asked, such as, do you support putting more people on the public payroll and increasing the city's debt burden? Well, you're going to get a different result if you ask it that way than if you ask, would you support the sale of low-interest bonds to pay for a 5% increase in the number of police officers assigned to night duty? Asking it in the first way, it just looks like you're going to increase taxes or increase the city debt and you're going to be hiring a bunch of more people and no one's going to answer yes to that question. But if you get to this point where you're going to have low interest, that debt will not cost a lot and it's going to provide a 5% increase in police officers, which is going to help our safety, more people will answer yes. So you need to be able to explain a differing result. And let's finish off with just a few other concerns about polls. There is something called the bandwagon effect. Polls themselves can sway public opinion. If all you hear over and over again is that Joe Biden is going to defeat Donald Trump in the presidential election, then that in itself will tend to make people tend to either support Biden or believe that they don't need to go vote at all. Why should, if I'm a Trump supporter, why should I vote for Trump at all if it's already a given that Biden's going to win? That's the bandwagon effect. You don't want to just get on the bandwagon and follow the public opinion as it's being uh, reported to you or let that sway how you respond to events. Don't let polls become the news. A lot of times the poll seems to be what's leading off a news story. Don't let that happen. It's not the news. It should just reflect the news. 
And finally, polls are oftentimes anonymous. They may, the poll makers may have their own agenda. You need to be aware of that. And with that, we're going to close this presentation.